So hey, uh, thank you all for coming on this gorgeous day in Boulder, Colorado. Um, I would like to tell you that this, is, um, this lecture has three audiences. Uh, the first and most important audience is you, and thank you for coming uh, to this symposium. It's also going to be uh, delivered as a virtual keynote to the International Communication Association in April. Uh, they've decided that uh, since they're an international communication association and involved with technology and communication, why not have virtual keynotes as well as physically present keynotes? And then um, the publisher of a journal called Information Communication and Society has decided that it will give away some of its intellectual property, including the article on which this talk is based, uh, but they asked me to give them a, a YouTube video that they could offer as a package uh, to distribute this material for free. And since I'm very happy to have uh, our ideas distributed widely for free, we're also going to do this lecture as the accompaniment to the article that's coming out later this year. So without further ado, what's the logic of connective action? You've probably heard of the logic of collective action, uh, which often applies to complex organizations such as social movements. But I'm seeing things that are very large and somewhat enduring and relatively effective in terms of political targeting uh, and, and change, uh, but they don't look to me like social movements. So that's sort of the question that's been motivating my thinking along with my co-author uh, Alex Sedgerberg of, of Stockholm University. And we have shifted our frame of reference a bit to connective action. So how do we understand these really large-scale, rapidly forming movements that seem to be able to focus pressure politically and accomplish some things? The question of how much they can accomplish and how they do it is a really interesting open question still, I think. But how do they work? So are they sustainable and effective? Um, is their organizational form uh, uh, sort of functional? Does it create focus? Do we need focus in a world of moving targets where things change so rapidly that flexibility may be a more important property than, than focus. So here's some pictures from the uh, M15 uh, protest movement in, in Spain. This is a photo from the plaza, central plaza in Madrid. And, and this map suggests the growth of other mobilizations all across Spain that used social technology platforms to stay in touch with each other and coordinate um, activities. So are they different? Uh, are these significantly different in the way they work than classic social movements are? Uh, these data are, are thanks to a very wonderful team of generous colleagues in Spain, Eva Anduisa and Camilo Cristancho and Jose Sabuceiro, who have been interviewing protesters in the midst of protests. Uh, and they've done a number of these uh, interviews including uh, anti-abortion protests, a general strike mobilization, and regional uh, separation protest movements. And what they've found, and they've compared them with the 15M or the Indignados uh, protests, as, as we may know them more familiarly. Uh, and what they found are several interesting things. I'm just presenting a tiny slice of their data. For example, if, if you ask the protesters in these five different protests to name organizations with which they affiliate, um, only 30% of the organizations named by the indignados actually have street addresses. In fact, the most prominent organizations named are websites. So is a website a political organization? I, I would suggest, yeah, it is. It's just a different kind of one. Uh, what's the average age of the organizations named by the indignados? Three years on average compared to 10 to 43, depending on whether you're looking at a union organized general strike or some of these other social movement type protests. And here's the one that got me. Only 13% of the organizations that were named by the indignados enable you to become members. I mean, it's often thought that membership and close ties are very important in movement organization. Only 13% compared to 60 to 100% in the case of unions um, mentioned by other protesters. So let me look at some historic backdrop on how these changes might have uh, come to be. Uh, in the post-industrial democracies, we've gone through a, a 30, 40 years of individuation from the uh, mass society and, and its sort of uh, undergirdings of, of uh, civil society organizations 
to a much more networked society as people fall away from civil society memberships. Uh, we, we've had 30 years of global neoliberal economic reforms, which has really killed the, the ideological coherence and the party identification of left parties, social democrats and labor parties in Europe in particular, uh, and has created the strange hybrids that we've seen in the US with Clinton uh, and Obama. And the globalization and, and marketization of not just uh, finance, banking, and production, but also of schools and healthcare and other kinds of public goods within nations uh, has, has really led to an undermining of the capacity of governments to want to or be able to deal with pressing problems that are increasingly spiraling together, such as the economic crisis, uh, the energy crisis, and the environmental crisis, all of which are more and more tightly related. So politics is becoming more personalized. People, younger people in particular, are pulling away from parties and group affiliations. Um, and losing the faith that government can solve problems. A lot of young people want the government to solve problems, so it's not necessarily an anti-government uh, orientation, but the sense that the government isn't working is pretty pervasive. And, and so that's the post-industrial democracy sketch. In five minutes, what's happened to the post-industrial democracies in the last 30 years? Um, that could be the subject of an entire course. But, uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about things like the Arab Spring. So how did they fit in? Well, here, here's my really quick and dirty uh, version of that story, which is that authoritarian regimes, particularly those like Tunisia and Egypt, have been policing and dismantling civil society leaving particularly young people isolated but technologically equipped. So there is a personalization process going on there as well. So with that backdrop, let's look at what personalized politics does to collective action. The classic formulation of Mansur Olson and many generations of social scientists since Mansur Olson has been this. You, you have resource intensive organizations that produce leadership and use those organizational resources to bridge differences with other organizations and develop collective action frames under which they can march together toward a cause, whether that be civil rights or union uh, rights, collective bargaining rights, or uh, teachers' rights or uh, in individual group identity rights. Digital media can be useful in, in these kinds of, of collective action formations, mainly to reduce the costs of communicating and to help manage the participation of members and close followers. But they don't change the game. Okay? It's, it's an enhancement, but it's not a game changer. The logic of connective action that we're beginning to develop involves personal action frames, like we are the 99% that are easily personalized in terms of a story you already have about yourself that doesn't require you to find the story of the collectivity out there and adapt to it. And also to use social media to keep yourself from being isolated in that story and to share it often really widely with large numbers of, of other people. So the logic of, of action changes because personalized content is self-motivating. I mean, the core kernel of difficulty in the collective action formulation was the free rider problem. And how do you overcome self-interest and get people to make sacrifices, incur costs to join a collectivity that might actually give you the benefits that you're looking for anyway without you having to participate? The personal action scenario is, I'm already motivated because this is my story. I want to share it. And then technology enables that sharing, again, with the right kinds of platforms attached to often very large uh, networks. So communication in this scheme is both a content distribution process, which is what we typically think of communication as, but it's also an organizational process. And that's really the biggest shift. So we've got a motivational shift. You've got a, a, an organizational shift going on with connective action. So digital media changed the game. So it becomes a game changer. Very quickly, I'm going to go through three types of uh, large-scale action organizations that we've been looking at. On your far right is 
traditional collective action of the sort we associate with social movements in which there are organizations that mobilize resources to bridge differences, to develop collective action frames, to share a common cause. Okay, that's the traditional social movement model over there. It turns out that as global change has personalized people's politics, it's hard for individuals, even NGOs or, or organizations, I'm sorry, like NGOs such as Greenpeace or Oxfam uh, and others to get members to join up and pay dues and follow instructions. So indeed, there have been stresses on organizations, many of which have moved into this kind of hybrid model in the middle, where there are still organizations in the picture, uh, large NGOs, for example, with resources, but what they're doing is stepping back from issues and deploying often really large batteries of social technology and interactive media so individuals can personalize their relationships to the issues and share those with their own social networks. So organizations become far less controlling and more oriented to creating large social networks uh, than to owning the issue or branding it in terms of one organization or another. And then over here we have a self-organizing uh, ideal type which is really personalized action on a large scale, often with technology that emerges because a lot of activists are tech developers. Uh, we're dealing with some of them in the, the national tech developer network of Occupy. And so they know how to build platforms that help stabilize and create organizations uh, to, to advance their cause and focus and organize their communication. So there's a classic collective action model, there's a hybrid model with organizations in the mix, and there is a self-organizing model. And the thing that's interesting and gets confusing sometimes is that they can appear in different patterns in different kinds of mobilizations. So sometimes they all coexist together and sometimes it's very chaotic. I mean, we've seen protests against the G20 at the beginning of this global financial crisis where some of the protests were not well coordinated. You had self-organizing protests, you had uh, organizations trying to step back and promote uh, personalized engagement, and you had very uh, ideological, hardcore social movement, uh, anti-capitalist uh, organizations all in the same mix, and sometimes it didn't go well. And then if you add police to that, it often didn't go well. But we've also seen cases such as Occupy and such as the Tahrir Square uh, uprisings in which you get sort of a dominant type, uh, namely a, a largely self-organizing pattern using technology. And then sometimes there are transitions where you now are beginning to move toward uh, the Arab Spring 2.0, toward Occupy 2.0, where people are beginning to explore, is there a middle place for us? Can we create organization? And what's the role of technology going to be in that organization? All of these organization collective action types the two connective action types and the one classic collective action model um, contain power and influence distributions in the networks. And one of the things that we're now looking at, which I don't have time to go into today, is how does a self-organizing network look in power and influence terms? How does the hybrid network look in power distributions? And how do social movement models look in power distributions? And, and they're, they're different, but you find uh, interesting patterns. So to summarize this far, and now we're going to start having a little fun with these kind of heavy concepts. Um, connective action is digitally networked action, which we're provisionally calling DNA, it's just so you can have some takeaways here. So DNA consists of two things, personal action frames. That's the content of what we used to focus almost everything on in communication studies. And, um, also, the digitally enabled networks over which that content travels and sometimes drops into large hubs that become the organizations uh, of these networks. And they can uh, either be largely self-organizing or there may be organizations in the background that are promoting social technologies and enabling a, a lot of freedom of, for individuals to share their own stories with their own social networks. So let's look at the first piece of this. I'm going to look first at the action frames, the content piece, and then we'll look at the technology piece. Communication content. How does the, the connective action uh, communication content differ from the collective action content? Well, it's it framing. I mean, there's a huge field of social science devoted to framing studies. How do 
frames travel so people can uh, sort of adopt them or oppose them, and how does that affect the organization of the politics that results? Personal action frames are sort of the I am the 99% variety where you can send your own message. And here's a story about trying to help my parents uh, who've immigrated for the American dream, but it's been eaten up by greedy politicians and CEOs. The collective action version might look sort of like that. Let, well, let's eat those greedy CEOs. Let's eat the bankers. So I want to talk about how these different kinds of content frames travel uh, in collective and connective action. One thing that's important, I think, is, is the, the focus on the personal action frames is really about you. Um, you may recall that you were the person of the year in Time Magazine's 2006 person of the year uh, contest. So congratulations. Um, you are now the focus, the center of your world. But sometimes your world is every bit as large as the world of the mass media and, and mass movements. So here's an interesting, uh, the October 15th mobilization was a global mobilization that connected the indignados in Spain with many uh, protest groups in Europe and the Occupy protesters in the US. And instead of a who are we page or an about us page, it was an about you page. Who are you? And it was a very interesting uh, page to read that said, don't worry about us. We are you, you are us, and it's more important that you figure out what you're going to do to take action. So what I'm seeing are two different kinds of memes that travel. Does everybody know what memes are? It's, it's Richard Dawkins' contribution to communication. Dawkins is a biologist. He's actually a, a historian of, of you know, science. But he, he's, a, he, he's been probably the greatest popularizer of biology and particularly evolutionary theories in, in our time. And before he was, as he was writing the book, The Selfish Gene, which came out in the 70s, Someone challenged him to say, but what about culture? Do, do genes determine culture? You can't determine everything genetically, can you? And he said, well, that's a really good question. So what is it about the biological equipment that humans have that enables the production of such diverse cultures? And he decided that what it is is that we have the capacity to imitate and share. So back to that idea about how things travel and personalization uh, versus collectivization. Um, that meme is the elemental cultural unit that is transmitted by our biological capacity to imitate and then reproduce our own version of what we've just imitated. So that's the idea. But it seems to me that there are personal memes and collective memes, okay, to make the world a simple place. Uh, let's just say there are two kinds of memes. Um, and personal memes can travel farther with less work because they're based on our interpersonal sharing of our personal stories, which is what we do most of the time. So it's easy to do, and when stories have a common frame, like we are the 99%, it's easy to then scale up that sharing operation. On the other hand, collective memes, collective action frames, are more exclusive and they hit the edges of networks and often don't cross over because they are harder for people to embrace because they require identity shifts. So they take cultural work. That, that There are a lot of good collective action memes that have traveled, but they don't travel just because we casually share them, although we may among the already converted. But they often require cultural work to produce their adoptable versions so you can imitate them. So what is that cultural work um, look like, well, eat the rich. Let's go back to that. It's one of my favorite collective action uh, frames. So let's look at the short story. It began with one of my heroes, Rousseau, who was kind of a quiet radical. And as he was observing the chaos uh, of France in his time, he said, when people shall have nothing more to eat, they will eat the rich. Well, it's quite amazing that that meme has been passed down as, as far and as wide as it has, but it's taken a lot of cultural work. So one of my favorite bits of cultural work is the Aerosmith song uh, of the same title. I'm sick of all your bitching about your poodles and your pills. I just can't see no humor about your way of life. I think I can do more for you with this here fork and knife. Eat the rich, eat the rich, eat the rich. Turns out that's you know, a rock anthem uh, of sorts uh, in the spirit of angry rock. And um, Banksy got into the act. A two for one offer includes choice of wine. 
eat the rich bar and grill, eat the rich t-shirts, and eat the rich cardboard signs that go into a street demonstration. So the we are the 99% seems to me to invite less cultural work and more personal sharing. Uh, so the short story of that action frame is uh, that we all get it, or at least 99% of us get it. Um, and it, it was promoted easily by a micro blog on Tumblr um, in which it, the blog site was beautifully done and invited people to take desktop photos of themselves and, and create their own stories of their experience in the 99%. And so if you go to that site, you see hundreds and hundreds of these lovely photos with people just holding up their personal story about what their life in the 99% has felt like. And as you know, the 99% meme has become kind of the, the grand uh, frame for Occupy. So it's, it's, it's caught on, and it's caught on globally, um, that October 15th Who Are You demonstration uh, enabled the 99% to express themselves all over the world. This is an Australian 99% uh, protest. And how then do we communicate these content frames on a scale that both spreads um, the, the political sentiment but also helps organize it so that it stabilizes and begins to develop points and uh, targets? Well, there are lots of technologies, super dense technologies. And what I want to do is go back to that three ideal types of collective and connective action for just a moment and say that, that in the digitally networked action, there are these two varieties, self-organizing and with organizations in the background and promoting social media in the foreground, and then um, the organizationally brokered action. So I want to run through those three types in terms of their content framing and their uses of technology. So relatively self-organizing networks, let's start with that one because it's, I think, the most fun and the most novel uh, addition to our political landscape in, in recent years. This is the uh, We Are All Khaled Saeed Facebook page that was uh, created by Wail Gonim, who's uh, become sort of a face of, of the Egyptian uprising, though he continues to say, I am not a leader, I am not a leader, I am not a leader. Uh, we are all together uh, leaders. No one was the hero here. Um, and this page still continues to work while many tech developers and activists in Egypt are meeting endlessly to figure out what kind of political organization makes sense in a military regime, right? I mean, there, there is a reality out there that you have to take into account when you're thinking about political organization and its various uh, strengths and weaknesses. Behind all of these um, technology uh, networks are just layers and layers and layers of dense technology. This is 26 minutes in just one Occupy Twitter stream, 26 minutes. And, and one, by one count, there were 100,000 different hashtags employed at one point or another in the, just the Twitter layer of the technology networks. And there are so many layers, live stream and Facebook and, and on and on and on, meetups uh, and so on. So this highly personalized content travels out through links and all kinds of other references through photos, on Flickr pages, on websites. Here's one that became very popular in the UK in 2008, 2009, during the protests against uh, the, the economic crisis when the G20 and the G8 were meeting all over the world in, in desperate sessions to try and figure out what to do uh, before the, the economy collapsed completely underneath all of us. This is a blogger called Lego Festo uh, who blogged about things. This is the death of a protester in one of the London demonstrations at the hands of police, an innocent bystander, not a protester, I should say. Um, and she blogged about it and became rather popular, uh, written up in Time magazine and, and had quite a following because these networks kept relinking to, to her blogs. In saying this, I don't want to forget the importance of human agency. I mean, it's not all about technology. There are these people. This is just a, a shot of, of one day in the Indignados uprising. And many of these people, in addition to meeting endlessly um, about what to do and how to do it, 
um, also are not entirely in agreement about the virtues of technology. Many of them believe that without face-to-face -face conventional organizing, we won't get a movement going. Well, there's a movement strain. When I said that all three types of action formations occur in the same scenes, some of these people want to be a movement. And some of these people don't want to have idle clicktivism going on just through the use of technology. They want people to come down, to commit, to take costly action. On the other hand, without a public, these people wouldn't be getting their message out. And, and the media in both Spain and the US has been remarkably receptive to these people because they are representing themselves not as the eat the banker crowd, but as the we are the 99% crowd, which is a lot easier to relate to if you're a journalist trying to tell a story. A survey in Spain last summer, Spain has 40 million people, six to eight million people responded by saying that they had been part of the Indignados protests. Huge, huge uh, public following. So once again, human agency matters. But it's often very confused and quite conflicted in terms of the kind of collective action that people in these crowds envision for everyone else. So the second type of, of connective action is organizations in the background. You can see all those protest banners there, Oxfam and WWF. This was a London protest that drew 35,000 people when the, the G20 met in London in 2009, in the spring of 2009. But the interesting thing is that the main protest website, a couple of interesting things, these organizations stood back behind a common protest website that wasn't branded by any of them, that was simply open to all of them. And the front page of this website was, again, who are you? Send your message to the G20, and for the weeks around this protest, these messages, I think they're still scrolling some of them on that website. As you can see, the only collective action uh, statement being made here really is the police uh, in the front lines. Uh, they're heavily organized collectively. So we've been looking at a lot of these networks that include Oxfam and WWF and KFOD and some of the big NGOs, Greenpeace. And what we're finding, this is a, a, a portrait of, of sort of economic justice, trade justice, fair trade in the UK. They're very dense, they're very stable, but when we look at each of these websites, this is a Think of this as a satellite photo of the Economic Justice NGO network in the UK. When we look at each of these websites for their technology deployments, what we find are often high, high numbers of social technology. I mean, they all have Facebook pages, but that's not even the most important bit. They have tell your story here, share your story with your friends, create your own uh, expression at our demonstration. Go with your friends if you're young socialists from Cambridge. Go with the, the young socialists if you're church ladies from Oxford. Go with them and come together because your story should be privileged in our um, movement. And so there's a, a, a sort of a, a middle case, this interesting hybrid of yes, they're organizations, but yes, they're using personalized communication technologies as their network uh, development tool. Then you also have this third type of social movements where everybody shows up with formal placards all saying the same thing um, and, and they are marching together under the same common frame. They may show up in that other crowd. As I say, they get mixed together in many protests, but they can be taken out and, and examined as a different kind of collectivity in that crowd. And then there are these folks, and we can't even uh, find their networks because they're anarchists. The anarchists don't publicize, uh, they don't have websites with rich social technologies on them, uh, but they do have some um, kind of exclusive images, some collective action images. This is the, uh, the four horsemen of death riding to the Bank of England uh, in London during the, the G20 protests in 2009. So as I said, sometimes all three of these ideal types of action uh, overlap. Sometimes there's a dominant type that you can identify. Sometimes there are transitions going on among them. So let's ask some next questions. What about the sustainability and effectiveness of the connective action types, these self-organizing networks and the organizationally enabled but not necessarily uh, collective action framed networks? Well, let's look at a, a picture of discourses in the US on inequality in November of, of this last year. 
and uh, this is a, 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 a look at the U.S. online media discourse, which includes all the main national newspapers and big city newspapers, all the big blogs, the Red State and the Daily Cause and all of that, and down to a level of, of blogs that people actually link to in, in some large numbers, um, and cutting off the kind of the, the bottom tail uh, for simplicity's sake. Um, so it's a large database that has a lot of media sites in it, and what, what I found when I queried it in terms of what are the terms that are being associated with the word inequality? Okay, and you see inequality at the center, that's because I selected for inequality. I wanted to see who was talking about it and what were they saying, but I wanted to look at the whole mediascape rather than you know, do that painful content analysis of the New York Times, which I, I used to do. Um, and what we find is that, that among the closest associates of inequality in November were Occupy Wall Street. And look at where Obama is out on the very tail. And that wasn't even Obama. That was the Obama administration had a chain uh, of co-linking terms that long to get out to the edge of this picture. Then some things happened. I mean, Obama had been signaling that he was concerned about something like inequality, but he hadn't been framing it too sharply uh, before that. But some things happened in the fall. Um, Public opinion had been obviously in favor of taxing the rich by, by substantial majorities for some time, but a lot of opinion didn't necessarily shift in support of the occupiers who remained a bit of an unknown collectivity, uh, but the, it did shift in terms of important things such as this Pew study that came out showing that uh, Americans were beginning to see conflict between the rich and the poor. America is not supposed to have that, as you know. The, the model of the American dream suggests that we can all move up the ladder, and people finally began to figure out that isn't happening anymore. Um, and then Occupy began to occupy Obama. That was a kind of a brilliant strategy. They started occupying Obama, they started occupying Democratic fundraisers, in particular, the one where Obama went to Wall Street both to apologize for calling them fat cats, which really annoyed them a lot, and to ask for money back from them so that they could fill his campaign coffers. The Occupy protesters were there. What, I think that at some point, looking at the opinion polls, looking at the, the sort of increasing heat directly from the protests, and the 99% personal action frame of members floating above all of that. So it's a very attractive frame. It, it doesn't require you to get defensive and back off and disclaim it. Suddenly Obama channels Teddy Roosevelt, and this is a wonderful moment when, the, when I filtered on inequality, Occupy Wall Street and Obama, I discovered that they're right, Occupy Wall Street and Obama owned inequality together. They were right there, the closest references to it, and Teddy Roosevelt was standing right behind Obama. So he really did channel Teddy Roosevelt in Osawatomie, Kansas. The media, and this is media discourse, which means that the media picked up on the Teddy Roosevelt story, uh, connecting it to Obama and inequality um, to help us refresh our memories about why Teddy Roosevelt might have been chosen by Obama as his uh, muse. So at the State of the Union, uh, having sense that this was a workable strategy, he, he he really claimed it in, in the State of the Union. And these are, the red line that peaks here is uh, news articles that contain references to both Obama and inequality. So he owned the discourse that, that week. But as you can see, the green and purple lines um, are tracking together, and the purple is Occupy Wall Street in the news, the green is inequality in the news, and they have now established almost a sine wave together. Um, and, and they co-occur, but they occur in independent stories now. So inequality has become a story of its own, Occupy has become a story of its own, and they've developed a kind of symbiotic press pattern, which is pretty interesting to, to follow. The um, blue line at the bottom is the, the co-occurrence of inequality and Occupy in the same, same story, and you see that there are times when it bumps up uh, into some prominence, but uh, namely, these stories now have a life of their own and they're fairly sympathetic as the media are beginning to tell them. So where would we go uh, from here? So we've got some, some ideas about how these large-scale connectivities 
can be stable. They can use technology as organization. Uh, they can develop frames that work for large numbers of people um, and, and help outsider publics begin to engage and adopt even uh, those frames for themselves. But I think we, we have, a, what, what I see now in this work is that we've now got an agenda. We've got a really interesting research agenda that goes in many, many directions. Um, you know, what is the, the importance of entirely technological organization as large hubs in these networks? So many, back to the first slide I showed you with data on it from the Spanish protests, the reason that so few of those organizations had street addresses or could, you could join is largely because they're websites. They, they are really sophisticated websites with all kinds of things you can connect to and from uh, uh, through them, but th they are websites. So I think we have to look at websites and technology and email and Twitter and Facebook and Flickr and all of these things as, um, well, maybe Bruno Latour uh, invites us to do as actants, uh, as non-human agents in networks that are acting while we're sleeping, that are acting while we're at work, that are keeping us in touch the next time we check in on Twitter or even on email. So that, that the network itself becomes a merger of face-to-face, -face, painful, long, endless meetings, and the tweets that come out of them to reach uh, sometimes epic proportion in them the millions a day on some of these streams. So that's a, an agenda, but I think also for, for political purposes, there's an agenda of what are the, the capacities and limits. Um, we've seen, interestingly enough, that many of these connective action formations have gotten more favorable media coverage than classic social movements tend to get, as Todd has written uh, a good bit about. Uh, and, and that's interesting to think about. The framing might change the way media coverage works. Although there's some puzzling features. When reporters wade into Occupy protests, they come back confused. They come back saying, these people are all over the place. These people don't have a common message. What are they up to? They're kind of disorganized and chaotic. And yet when they step back, the same reporters can write a story about we are the 99% and about inequality in America. So the, the whole seems to be considerably greater than the, the sum of the parts. The closer you look, the less you see, uh, or the more uh, different things you see. And so how, how does that kind of communication, which is not like social movement communication um, in the conventional sense, how does that work? And are there capacities to set goals and strategies? Um, it, to some degree, I think, yes, but to some degree, uh, the Occupy, for example, has taken a lot of kind of oddball actions. Why Occupy in Seattle and Oakland shut down the West Coast ports uh, without having union support for that action is a puzzling, puzzling question. Um, on the other hand, uh, the ethos reigning in Occupy is we act if you convince us to do it. So it's all about you. It's sort of like Kickstarter to you know, get other people to help support your new, your new business idea. If you can get 1,000 other people to march to the port of Seattle or even 500 and shut it down, um, that's fine. That's what we're all about. We're not going to tell you that that's a bad idea. So this property of connectivities um, is, is interesting, but it certainly isn't like uh, conventional social movements, at least uh, until they start splintering and fracturing um, into those kinds of actions. Um, and, and then the, the other agenda that, that is interesting to explore here is, is how's the movement across these three ideal types that we've tried to identify, how does that work? Um, the movement toward Arab Spring 2.0 or Occupy 2.0. One of our research projects in Seattle is currently, we're working with a, a, a network of national Occupy tech developers. And it's been a very interesting process because it, it's very slippery. There's no leadership, there's no decision making. There's only can you sell these ideas and do they seem workable to us and do we want to invest our time and energy in them and then share them with others. Of course, sharing them with others means you get new inputs and you go back two or three steps every time you invite new people into the circle. And so it's quite an interesting process. But the key in, in terms of where the movement is going seems to be a, a huge amount of friction between 
a lot of people who think that only face-to-face old-fashioned organizing is going to produce what we want to produce, namely a classic social movement with an agenda and power behind it. Whereas many other people think, no, you'll lose the public if you do that. If you do that, the, the people who are interested in being part of the 99% will start peeling off because your collective action frames will be really not inviting to them, not attractive to them. So another school of thought is through technology, we can create loose ties and engage people on their own terms, much in the way the movement has evolved to this stage already, and continue to do that perhaps with, with better technology. So that's a huge friction point that, that we are currently kind of in the middle of and, and finding it quite interesting to figure out um, how to participate in the development of organizational technology. And then, um, Here's the kicker to me, it, it, going back to that very first slide about what's happened in the world to produce these different kinds of, of action, these connectivities, um, the personalization of politics and the dispersion of power away from governments and toward corporations and global kinds of decision-making regimes. Those are two huge and, and interesting trends. Um, if, if governments in domestic uh, settings like the US have lost their capacity and, and will, I mean, which comes first, I don't know. But if they've lost the will and the capacity to address these big problems of inequality and the growth of inequality and how to stop it, of the energy crisis, the, the tar sands of Canada, uh, you know, to refineries in Louisiana, it only makes sense if you're among the corporations who will profit from that, right? So, but on the other hand, those corporations are filling the campaign accounts of the decision makers in Washington who are profiting politically from it. So, you know, when, when you have the perception that government is incapable of response, what kind of politics do you organize? And, and it seems to me that the Arab Spring 2.0 is, is directly confronting that question as well. Here you've got a military regime, you have elections that might get the Muslim Brotherhood into power, um, and, and they might have to contend with the Tahrir Square protesters and change who they are as an organization. And that, that may be an interesting development to watch. But what are the limits of your organization given the political realities that, that you face? And a lot of, of networks of protest around the world face similar kinds of questions. Environmentalists have been up against it. I mean, large majorities of publics, especially in Europe, um, favor strong action to, to stop global warming and change the nature of our ener energy systems. And, and that was actually true in the US uh, up until 2004, 2005, when a massive Republican and Exxon and other carbon energy corporations funded basically propaganda campaigns to erode the perception of the importance of the energy problem and the environmental crisis, and to erode the, the sense even that scientists were in agreement about of the magnitude and the causes of the environmental crisis. So now US public opinion has, has eroded actually on environmental uh, decisions. Um, but that's, that's sort of another story. The question is, what kind of political organization works under what kinds of political conditions? And that's, those are tricky, tricky questions to sort out, which may be why connectivities have become so popular for people to join at least they can follow the moving targets and express themselves with others knowing that they are doing the right thing. So those are the things we've been working on lately. And uh, it's a pretty exciting time to be doing it since uh, the world is uh, full of different formations of the sort we've tried to capture uh, theoretically. So I thank you for your uh, attention.